Hi, guys. It is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, over-the-top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the Finger Lakes of New York. And it is September 1st, 2022. And shockingly, guys, uh, I am coming out of hibernation. And I have the great pleasure of bringing back on to the show for the third time in my life. We're going to uh, speak to a retired journalism professor from my old uh, stomping grounds, Austin, Texas, a retired journalism professor from University of Texas at Austin, none other than our old buddy, Robert Jensen. And Robert and his friend, Wes Jackson, have come out with a brand new book, and it is a must read. And unfortunately, I've only had time to read the first 16 pages. <laughs> title of the new book, An Inconvenient Apocalypse. An Inconvenient Apocalypse, obviously a play on uh, An Inconvenient Truth. So, uh, unfortunately, Wes Jackson is not able to join us, but we have Robert Jensen, and it is always a pleasure. So, Robert, come on and say hi to the folks at Collapse Chronicles, and we're just going to dive right into this uh, rousing conversation for the next 45 minutes to an hour. Great. Well, it's good to be back in contact. We both left Austin, you to New York State, me to New Mexico. Uh, which proves how smart we are. We got out of Texas. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. Great minds do think alike. So, uh, so guys, we are just we're just going to we're just going to dive right into this. I uh, I, I was going to start out with this rather strange review from the Guardian on this book that alerted me to it, but. I, I think we're going to have our own review, uh, and we might come back a little bit later. So we're going to dive in to the book itself. And mm -hmm. I, I hate when people are or people like me are talking about new books, and they spend twenty minutes just reading long sections of the book mm -hmm. and say, "What is your comment?" So we're going to read just some a real short. Uh, section okay uh about this whole world apocalypse uh, and we're going let's see let's just choose a let's just choose good lord just dive in right here and you run with it uh of course You know, it, are you talking about the definition of the word apocalypse? You want to let's start, start there? there. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's just okay. let's just start there. We're going okay. to be so so, uh, so easy for me because I would I would no. make my own mistake. I can yeah. see them. So okay. Before I do that, I do want to tell people a bit about who Wes Jackson is. Um, Wes uh, is for me one of the most important people who helped me understand. Uh, the ecological crises. Uh, Wes is a Kansas farm boy by birth, went off and got a PhD in genetics and was on his way to a typical university teaching career when in the early 70s he decided to leave university teaching and, and he co-founded something called the Land Institute, which was an alternative school at first in Salina, Kansas, and then morphed more into a research institution pursuing the question of uh, can we develop perennial grains, that is grains that don't need to be plowed and planted every year, uh, as a, a potential uh, major contribution to solving the agricultural crises. There's a long story behind that, but if one is in the sustainable ag world, uh, you might know Wes Jackson's name. Uh, Wes has been, I think, a powerful advocate for a, a different way of thinking about the world coming out of you know a US Western Eurocentric background, but uh, dramatically thinking differently. The other thing about Wes is he's been thinking about the question of collapse and apocalyptic uh, endings 
uh, since the late 60s. When he was teaching at a small college in 1969, he helped start a, a program they called Survival Studies. So these things have been on Wes's mind for a long time, and, and I've been a big fan of his work and in the last 10 years, I've gotten to know him, and in the last five years, been able to, to write with him, which has been a real pleasure. This book came out of conversations about how to signal the depth of the, what I call the multiple cascading ecological crises without simply throwing up your hands in nihilistic fashion. And, and Wes is a great example of someone who's been aware of the nature of the crises, but kept working at it. So this book evolved out of these conversations and we try to do several things. We try to think about how we got here, not as a merely intellectual exercise, but to understand you know, what it is about human nature that left us in this particular place. Then we try to ask the really hard questions that people tend to avoid. And then, um, suggest some things we might do because of this. And that's where the apocalyptic comes in. We have a chapter called We're All Apocalyptic Now, uh, a play on the famous uh, uh, line from the 19th century when somebody said, we're all socialists now after the critique of capitalism. So what does it mean to say we're all apocalyptic now? It means either we should be or are thinking in apocalyptic terms, not in the sense of the end of the world. In pop culture, people take the word apocalypse to mean the world ending, but that's not actually what it means. It's from the Greek. It's the uh, same term as revelation in Latin. And it means a lifting of the veil, coming to new understanding, a kind of clarity that comes when you see the world differently. And we are saying that it's an apocalyptic time. We need to lift the veil, all the, the delusions we've created for ourselves and face some really hard questions. And, and although we're not talking about the end of the world, you know, the planet is gonna continue on long after humans are gone, uh, but we are talking about the end of systems. We have to think about living without the current systems we have, political, economic, social systems, those are going to end. And so that's what we mean by apocalyptic, a, a kind of brutal honesty about the nature of reality and a willingness to think about a different way of living. I, I liked your, I think it was from that very chapter, it's not about rapture, but a rupture, yeah. severe enough to change the nature of the whole game. Yeah. And not that, rapture, but rupture. <laughs> so what, what is the rupture that we're heading into yeah. severe enough to change the nature of the whole game? It, yeah, you know, use, using a, a term like apocalyptic that comes out of uh, the Christian tradition, obviously, the book of Revelation, um, it is dangerous in a sense when you're trying to reframe it and, and return to what I would say is a more uh, core meaning. Because the rapture, this idea that, you know, believers are going to be lifted up into heaven and the rest of us are in big trouble, uh, is a, a term that commonly comes to people's minds when they hear apocalypse or apocalyptic. And that's obviously not what we're talking about. We're using the term not theologically, but secular, uh, in secular fashion. And the rupture is quite clear. The rupture between the human species and the larger living world. Now, uh, a lot of people point to, you know, the last couple of centuries, the development of fossil fuels, the industrial revolution, global capitalism as the beginning of the problem. But Wes has long been arguing that to really understand that rupture, you have to go back to the original break with nature, which is agriculture. Now, this requires a, a bit of, uh, you know, sort of uh, basic anthropology to remember that the human species, Homo sapiens, we've been around somewhere between 200 and 300,000 years, but we've only been farming. We only started domesticating plants and animals about 10 to 12,000 years ago. So we are a fairly recent species to farm in. And it's that agriculture that the, the way in which human beings believe they could take control of plants and animals and bend them to our needs, that shift from a foraging society, what we typically call hunting and gathering, to an agricultural society is that original rupture, that break with nature. And that's where Wes would say, we began drawing down the ecological capital of the planet 
at beyond replacement levels, first by, by plowing the soil. Now, people often say, well, listen, not all agriculture is unsustainable, and that's true to a degree. What we're talking about here is the most important kind of agriculture that evolved first in the Middle East, but eventually all over the world, China and other places. And that's what we would call annual grain agriculture. Right. The, the annual agriculture planting every year, which has typically been done with plowing, which has typically led to high levels of soil erosion, to produce these surpluses of grains, wheat, corn, rice, these kind of grains that have been the real engine of you know, what we often call civilization, the beginning of a shift from largely mobile foraging, gathering hunting societies to sedentary agricultural societies and the hierarchies that we now see all around us, uh, where you have class hierarchies and other kinds of status hierarchies. So that was a long-winded way of saying, uh, the book tries to go back to what we believe is that fundamental break with nature, that first rupture, to understand why we're in the pickle we're in today. It's not just a problem of capitalism, although we agree capitalism is a problem. It's not just a problem of fossil fuels, although we agree fossil fuels are a big problem. Right? It's not just the development of industrial society. This is a problem human beings have been uh, living with now for 10,000 years. It, it seems to me, this is a point I am always making, it seems to me the problem is humans. <laughs> well, <laughs> There you got it. That, that's if, you, the, if you have to summarize what the problem on well, the planet is, the answer is humans. Well, the, the problem, if you think about the human species or the genus Homo, uh, uh, which, you know, as I said, humans are 200 to 300,000 years old. Uh, the, the genus Homo only goes back about two and a half million years. We're a relatively recent phenomenon on the planet, obviously. Right? And the problem is not really just humans because for most of human history, we lived in most places, not exclusive in all, but in most places, in a kind of roughly sustainable way. Um, some people have pointed that out, the problem isn't humans, it's intelligence. That what intelligence does is provide the methods by which one can outrun the, the, the ecosystems in which you live, right? And humans have used, we've used our intelligence to do that to, as, we, as I said, draw down the ecological capital of the planet beyond replacement levels. Now- it's really intelligent to me. Or, yeah, uh, you know, it, people have, have uh, jokingly said that intelligence, high intelligence might end up being a lethal mutation, right? That eventually society or uh, species that, that have too high a level of intelligence will destroy themselves. And part of that is because, and, and this again, is work that Wes has been doing for a long time, is that we are smart, uh, but we're never as smart as we think we are. The problem, one of the problems is that we can invent ways to manipulate ecosystems, and we do it all the time. But it's very hard with this intelligence to anticipate all of the consequences of that. Uh, you know, some people talk about the law of unintended consequences. When you do something, especially with technology, you can never know what the long-term effects will be. Uh, and of course, recent human history is littered with examples of how something we, we thought was, you know, a, a boon turned out to be uh, a, a dramatic threat to our own existence. You know, the, one of the examples we use in the book is the, the ozone layer. Uh, the hole in the ozone layer that developed because of the use of CFCs, a certain kind of chemical. Well, when CFCs were invented, I think it was back in the 30s, uh, they were thought to be a miracle chemical, uh, you know, non-reactive to other substances, safe. Uh, they did all these cool things, including allow us to, to do refrigeration and cooling. Well, at the level of the planet's surface, it turns out that CFCs were pretty uh, benign. But when they went up into the upper atmosphere, they started creating this ozone hole, which would have dramatically increased cancer and all that. That's just one example of how we can't predict the long-term consequences. Uh, certainly burning fossil fuels in internal combustion engines, when that was invented, that seemed like a pretty cool thing. You get rid of the horses, 
There's less horse manure on the streets. Everybody's happy. You can move faster. But of course, nobody could predict the consequences of burning all that petroleum. So this is just a, a feature of human existence. Uh, we're smart, but never quite smart enough to see further down the road and control the consequences of our own behavior. So I, I guess this might sound a little odd for somebody who taught at a university for 26 years, but people are, are too intelligent and then not intelligent enough at the same time. And it would be better if we realized how dumb we really are. Yes, uh, I think a few. Well, I, I've heard the word "clever." I'm yeah. sure you've heard that term, the the clever ape. Yeah, it's a difference between clever cleverness and yeah. intelligence. Yeah, would, would you differentiate between? Yeah, terms? well, it at this point, what we call it, um, I don't think really matters. But we constantly outrun our capacity to predict. Uh, and the problem is not that, you know, we did it and, and then we corrected it. The problem is we keep doing it. And this is where, uh, you know, I break with a lot of traditional environmental groups who, you know, say, well, we just need more electric vehicles or, you know, we just need this technology or that technology. Wes has long described that as a kind of technological fundamentalism where you believe technology will solve all problems Ironically, even the problems caused by earlier forms of technology. That's a real fundamental, fundamentalist belief system where you have an unchallengeable uh, uh, faith in a system uh, beyond reason. And so, you know, I, I take electric vehicles. Uh, I got nothing against electric vehicles. I drive a hybrid myself. But if we think we're going to solve all of our problems by simply replacing petroleum burning engines with electric vehicles, then we misdiagnose the problem because the problem is not just cars that burn gas, it's too many cars. In case nobody's figured it out, electric vehicles don't drop from the sky. They have to be produced by materials that are mined and manufactured, processed, metals, including a lot of rare earth metals, uh, rubber, plastic, all of those things. Well, guess what? those all come at an environmental cost. And to me, if you replaced every gas burning car today with an electric vehicle, it would at best slow the, the rate at which we are heading over the cliff, right? The, the real solution is just a lot fewer cars and a lot less expectations of being able to travel, right? In other words, the solution is limits. And that's one thing that the modern world doesn't know how to talk about intelligently, which is limits. How to, how, to, how to be the first species that imposes limits on itself. And that's why the challenge is so daunting because every other species, when it outstrips its resources and territory, limits are placed on it by other forces, disease, predation, all sorts of things, right? If the deer in, who live around me, uh, if the herd gets too big, that herd will be culled eventually, not because the deer decided to you know, limit their births, but because of food supplies and predators. Well, human beings uh, have learned how to temporarily you know, avoid those limits. And so we, we now have to learn to impose them on ourselves. Because if we wait for the, the larger forces of the world to impose those limits on us, those are gonna be ugly and inhumane in ways that we can't even imagine, right? When you start talking about a world of 8 billion people being reduced to a more sustainable level of population through natural forces, right? Uh, food shortages, water shortages, and the, the social struggles that come when those things happen, that's not gonna be pretty. So what Wes and I are arguing is we need to, to put limits, self-imposed limits, at the center of everything. And not just you and me deciding we're gonna, you know, travel less. I don't travel much anymore, but it's not, you know, a few old guys who decide to stop flying that's gonna to make a big change. So what does it mean to have a collective conversation in, especially in the first world societies, but worldwide, about the need to limit our consumption of energy and other material resources? 
Well, we don't know how to have that. No politician would dare stand up and even suggest that. Even politicians on the left who are now, supposedly- uh, Now, don't forget Mr. Macron, <laughs> a few days ago, this is the end of the age of abundance. Uh, yeah. What do you think about Macron getting up there? Did he commit political suicide by getting up there and announcing to his countrymen that this is the eight, the end of the age of abundance? Do you agree with him? And do you well, think he committed political suicide by making that obvious statement? I think it depends on what the one means by the end of the age of abundance. If that means all of a sudden we are going to, as my friend Stan Cox uh, has proposed, start imposing hard caps, hard limits on the amount of carbon that can be, can be used and that those are imposed by law in the same way you know, there was rationing and, and things in World War II, that you have a collective political decision to impose hard limits especially on fossil fuels, but on other forms of consumption as well. Well, that takes it from a kind of rhetorical place to a policy position that is going to be very hard. It's gonna be hard, not just because, you know, politicians, you know, tend to stand up and promise more, but because most of us have become pretty comfortable living in a society in which this highly dense carbon mostly in the form of fossil fuels, provides a lot of material comforts. Right? Now, it's true that a lot of our consumption is just wasteful, right? that capitalism produces incentives to waste, you know, planned obsolescence, uh, gratuitous consumption of, of material that doesn't even produce human happiness. There's all sorts of ways that our economic system is truly loony. But there are a lot of ways we use fossil fuels, for instance, that aren't the product of some capitalist indoctrination. They're, they're the product of, of, of the ease and comfort produced. Here's the example I use. Uh, uh, I had to uh, dig a hole because of a plumbing problem in the, in the pipe from our well to our house. And uh, I spent about eight hours digging a hole <laughs> so that the plumber could get down and fix that. Well, my back was pretty sore by the end of that eight hours, right? Now, of course, you could have brought a backhoe in and done the whole thing in, you know, 20 minutes, right? That's a good, that's an interesting choice. You know, the backhoe, the preference many people would have for the backhoe, I didn't do it just because I'm too cheap to pay somebody to bring a backhoe in. But, you know, it, some things that we do with energy simply make our lives better in the sense that they are less physically strenuous, and they provide more material comfort that we like, not because of propaganda from advertisers, but because it's easier. Now, if we are gonna reduce through collective action, our consumption of energy, especially fossil fuels, that means a whole lot of things we've been letting oil and gas and coal do, we're gonna to have to do ourselves. Farming is one place where this is most evident, right? If you wanna to move to a sustainable agriculture, it means far less energy that's used now for the production of fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and for traction you know, in tractors and combines. And if you're gonna do that, that means a whole lot more human work. It means more hoeing and weeding. It means more human collection of, of crops, you know, harvesting, right? The way that this was all done centuries ago. Okay, well, you know, there aren't many people I know in lefty political circles in, in urban centers in America who want to sign up to become agri full-time agricultural laborers right? because it's hard work. All right? So those are the kind of things we have to deal with. So you, you can say the age of abundance is over, but then you have to say, what does that mean in terms of political policy? What does it mean in terms of economic realities? What does it mean in terms of changes to the way we live day to day? Uh, and that's what Wes and I are trying to talk about, that these are, you know, among the hard questions society has been to date. Uh, okay, ignoring. now we, 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 we've been dancing around the subject and, and anyone who knows me has been listening to me for the past several years knows I'm over here biting my tongue. <laughs>
We've been dancing around the third rail. Neither one of us, well, I want to step on it, but uh, but we're getting ready to step on it. And, and let, let's gently segue into this. These changes in farming that you mentioned, which clearly going from a less fossil, less yeah. mechanized fossil fuel intensive level of global industrial agriculture to a more sustainable, we're talking organic. Sure. How many humans could that form of farming yeah. realistically feed on a planet? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, nor do you, nor does anybody else. But I is think it it's eight billion. It, I think the the answer is clearly considerably less than eight billion. So this population question, which you're right, is politically very volatile, is is right at the center of our book. In fact, in our chapter four hard questions, it's the first one we take on. Let's and take I, it on, brother. And so, Here's and so your take it uh, on. So let's first of all get a sense of the the timeline for the expansion of the human population. Uh, my father, who's still alive, was born in 1927. And the, the human population in 1927 was 2 billion people. That population has doubled and then doubled again in the, in the course of one human being's lifetime. That is unprecedented. And I think we forget about that. Now, as you're pointing out, uh, a lot of that population explosion came from the use of fossil fuels, especially natural gas in what is called the Haber-Bosch process to manufacture industrial fertilizer and hydrous ammonia, right? One scholar, Vaclav Smil, an excellent scholar from Canada, estimates that about 40% of the human population wouldn't be here without the Haber-Bosch process. One industrial process that produced industrial fertility for farming because natural fertility was declining and sources of fertility were declining as the population expanded, has made possible basically twice as many people on the planet as would otherwise be here. Well, if we're gonna ratchet down our use of oil, gas, coal, right? One of those aspects, as you point out, is going to be far less industrial fertility for farming. Now, some people who support agroecology, which is an umbrella term for those you know, methods you're talking about, organic, uh, you know, permaculture, all these kind of different systems, uh, they will argue that we can replace the current yields uh, with agroecological methods and, and wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. I think that's naive. I think there are, you know, times and places where agroecology can come close to matching the yields of industrial agriculture, but it's not going to do it on a planetary level, especially when the ecosystems of the world are so degraded, right? So I'm from the upper Midwest, I'm from North Dakota, and that is some of the most fertile land on the planet. But because of, of farming methods, it has steadily lost both soil itself to erosion and soil fertility. So we have less topsoil and less fertile topsoil. And once we, we stop what Wes sometimes calls a kind of chemotherapy of the land, the injection of fertility, through industrial methods, that land is not going to produce at the same level. We forget that the green, the so-called green revolution technologies of the post-World War II era that expanded yields dramatically. In, you know, for some crops, these industrial ag uh, methods have doubled yields, in some cases tripled yields. It is naive to think we're going to go back uh, or we're going to keep those levels of yields yet go back to to non-fossil fuel agriculture. So that means, uh, what is the sustainable level of a human population? Again, no one knows for sure, but I think it's good to start with an assumption that, that we should shoot for 4 billion. And some competent and very bright ecologists I know argue that over the long term, it's probably closer to 2 billion. Uh, William Rees, uh, for instance, from British Columbia, I think has done some of the best work on this. Dennis Meadows, one of the authors of the original Limits to Growth study, they both say that over time, we're going to probably have to get down to 2 billion people. Yeah, I've right. interviewed William. William Reese is a good, is a good guy. Yeah. Uh, so one of my favorite interviews of, yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. One of my heroes. 
Yeah, he's a good you're fun boy too. You're not quite ready to. You're not quite ready to go to the two billion. No, I'm saying that we have to start with a goal, right? So start with four. That's yeah. Four so four. let's think about what would it take to reduce the human population, uh, in some sort of humane fashion to four billion people. Okay. Well, that's uh, again, uh, no one has an answer to that question. And it may well be possible there is no answer to the question. I, I, I have an answer. Right. Okay. Well, then you answer it, and then I'll give you my my guess. Not to be well. People have heard me say it. Keep your pecker in your pants and don't let your knickers down. Okay. So one half of the equation is birth control. Yeah. And I and I think don't everybody breathe. agrees. But there are some problems with that. The people who don't want to admit how difficult this subject is. We'll say, well, when you educate women and girls, when you elevate the status of women and girls in society, birth rates go down, and that's true. But it's also true with that elevation of the status of women and girls often comes economic um, advancement, you know, so-called development, which increases per capita consumption. So that's there's a problem there. But I think the other thing that is just as hard to talk about is how to come up with a non-coercive birth control program, because I, I at least don't want to hand over to any government the ability to make decisions like that, although who knows it may come to that. But it's not just birth control. We don't do a very good job of birth control, but we do too good a job of death control. And this is the other part of the population question that nobody wants to talk about, is we have extended uh, lifespan to a degree that has created a problem as much as the number yeah. of births. So, you know, it's well known that an extraordinary percentage of, in, in a first world country like the US, an extraordinary percentage of our healthcare is spent, uh, dollars are spent on ex extending life. And what would it mean to say, we're not gonna do that anymore? That some of these advanced medical techniques, you know, organ transplants and, and uh, you know, really sophisticated forms of cancer treatment that we're just going to say we can't afford that anymore. And I don't just mean afford it in terms of money and resources, but we can't keep, a, you know, extending life like this uh, because that is part of the population question. And that's even harder to talk about than birth control, right? Because most people want to extend their lives. And so let's say, you know, grandma and grandpa both need extensive medical intervention to keep them alive. Well, maybe we say that once you're past, let's say the age of 70, there are no extraordinary methods to keep everybody alive. And I don't just mean, you know, do not resuscitate orders. I mean, collectively deciding we are not, no longer gonna invest in certain kinds of uh, life extension like that. I personally, have given this a lot of thought and made a personal decision, right? That I'm not gonna use those technologies if it comes to that. But we're not, again, just like when we talk about limiting energy consumption, we can't rely on individual choices. We have to figure out a policy. And so it's hard enough, you know, talking about contraception and abortion and birth control. It's even harder to talk about how we need to stop being so effective at death control. And so, you know, some people avoid the term, the, the question of population, as you, you said, but in some sense, they avoid it for perfectly uh, understandable reasons, because nobody has a, a solution to the problem. Nobody has a way to move from 8 billion people to, let's say, 4 billion people in a time frame that's meaningful, right, in a way that will slow down the ecological collapses. Right? Nobody knows how to do it. And when there's a daunting problem and people don't know how to do it. There's a real incentive to just ignore the problem. What Wes and I are saying is not, listen here, we've got, here's, here's, our, here's our off the shelf program to solve the population problem. What we're saying is until we start talking about it, there will be no hope of a solution. I know of no problem that has been solved when people refuse to acknowledge the problem. And that's all I can say in, I think sensibly about population control. It's about birth, it's about death, it's about limits, it's about coming to terms with the fact that we are all mortal and that living to be you know, 95 
might not be in the cards anymore. So. So that 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 that's that's as deep as you plumb the depths of the conversation. No, there's a lot of other problems in the conversation. One is, I, I, I mean, that, I, I, on 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 that uh, on that yeah. particular subject, I just want before we move on to to the other hard questions. You know, when I'm when I'm boiling it down, reading all of this stuff, particularly about what what I call the bright green lies. I'm yeah. sure you're familiar with, with Derek. Now, I don't think Derek Jetson's any relation to, to you at all, but no. you're familiar with all of that. Yes. With, 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 with all of that stuff, which we could turn into a whole nother uh, hour of conversation. But over and over again, it's just always, it just seems to me like people, whether mainstream media or on the right or the left, there's just this assumption that the population of this planet is going to pick your number 10 billion, 12 billion. And how are we going to respond to this from the supply side? It's all and nobody, nobody is talking about approaching the problem from the demand side about we have the we have the technology to reduce the demand for all of this for all of this stuff uh, by reducing those making the demands, meaning humans. Uh, yeah. But nobody is having the conversation on, on approaching this from the demand side, and I just want to. Well, do you have any input on that? Why that? Well, is? There, there are a lot of problems. It's, it's, if it were just as simple as saying, uh, you know, no couple can have more than one child or something, uh, that would be easy. Uh, it'd be hard to implement, but it would be easy to imagine. But that's only the beginning of the problem, the, the, the political difficulty. For instance, you also have something called the dependency ratio. If you dramatically reduce births, you're going to end up having an excess of older people who are no longer economically viable. You're gonna have economies that have to be restructured. It's not just about a simple reduction in population. It's about realizing we have to retool everything. And those are daunting questions that nobody has answers to. The other problem with population and the reason many people are, are hesitant to talk about it is for a long time, a lot of the strongest voices for population control were racists. They were people who, you know, were arguing against immigration. Uh, it was a, you know, even the eugenics crowd. I mean, a lot of the, the 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 voices for population control have been politically regressive and morally abhorrent people. And that's another reason that I think the folks don't like to pick up the subject because they fear being tainted. That if you talk about the need to control population, you're going to be lumped into a bunch of, you know, to put it crassly. Uh, fairly well-off white people in the first world who spent a long time lecturing brown people in the third world about why they needed to stop reproducing. Well, that racist history of the population control question is real, and people are scared of it. Like and they're scared you know of any, that, and you know that you're that you are getting ready. If not, if you haven't already been, you're getting ready to get lumped into that. I in right. the book in the book we point out that that is an impediment to people talking about it. We make it clear that we don't identify ourselves with those movements. You know, here's another simple thing, just like problems don't get solved if you ignore them, right? The fact that some nasty people once raised an issue doesn't mean that raising the issue makes you a nasty person. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, you know, people who've made arguments that I don't like. Uh, I don't like their motivations, uh, but it doesn't mean that if I address the same issue, I'm one of them. So yes, people do lump us in in that sense. But you know, again, we aren't going to make any progress if people stay silent out of fear. And so part of what this book is, uh, in addition to you know specific arguments we make, is just trying to say, listen, it's okay to talk about this. If you talk about this, you're not crazy, you're not depressive, you're not a downer, you know, you're not a racist, you're not a lunatic. You're not a religious nut. You can talk about all of these things as a reasonable, rational person with humane, progressive values and struggle. And I think too often when 
when the culture, and I include right, left, center in this, come up against these hard questions, uh, the struggle is just too much and they're abandoned. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. Wes and I are both, you know, we're relatively old. Uh, I don't care if people don't like me. Most people never did like me anyway. Uh, you know, I've had, I've, I've written about issues over the last 30 years that have made me a lot of enemies uh, and I'm still standing. Right. So we're not arguing for the sake of picking a fight. We're arguing to try and make it possible for people who share our concerns to voice their own opinions. Because right now, a lot of people who think about this, as you're pointing out, are just scared to talk about it. If they don't, they don't, if you, if you bring up, let's just take this general subject of collapse, the possibility that if not within my lifetime, within my child's lifetime, modern industrial civilization will no longer be viable and there will be massive changes that warrant the term collapse, okay? Well, you know, go to your average dinner party uh, and bring that up. And there's a lot of people who walk away, who get angry. I've had people scream at me about this stuff. Right? And so there are people thinking it, who want to talk about it, who want to start asking hard questions, but they, they're afraid. And so this book is partly just a way of saying, you don't have to be afraid. Normal, reasonable people, if you want to consider me and Wes Jackson normal and reasonable, and I think we're pretty normal and pretty reasonable, can talk about this, even say things that are difficult, and, and still get up every morning and do good work in the world and have friends and try to contribute. So there's, there's a, a kind of basic goal in the book to just normalize this kind of conversation. Well, I mean, obviously, a channel called Collapse Chronicles. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, you, you, you obviously have a friendly audience. Yeah. Here. I, I mean, what I do, yeah. for whatever reason I'm doing it, is I am simply chronicling the collapse of global industrial civilization as it is unfolding in real time and, and, and trying to normalize this yeah. conversation but uh, do you think the conversation is being more normalized or do you think with the, uh, you know, with, without bringing the, the orange hair monster in, into, the, in, in, into the conversation, uh, is this conversation being more normalized or is it in fact being like everything else more polarized? Well, I, in this case, I don't think the arguments we make map onto a traditional right-left dynamic. I yeah. come from the political left. I'm anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist. Uh, you know, I've written about uh, white supremacy and patriarchy. I'm a pretty standard issue lefty in a lot of ways. Uh, but I find as many people on the left resistant as on the right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so will it ever be normalized? I doubt in my lifetime. But then again, you know, then if I live, you know, another decade, it's hard to tell what, what might happen. I think there's been a, a change uh, just in the last year or two in people's willingness to talk about some of this. When you look at droughts and wildfires and storms and, and the way that um, the larger living world is pressing on us in, in ways that get harder to avoid. But you know, one can never predict these things. So uh, I hope that the book we wrote just makes it possible for somebody to start a conversation. And you know, we do. We've been talking about these four hard questions, and maybe that's a good place to to talk about them. In addition to the problem of what is a sustainable size of the human population, a hard question. Not only because we don't know how easily to reduce the human population. But the number of people alone is only half of the question. It's what level of consumption are those people living at, right? So that's the question of size. We also talk about the problem of scale, right? That human beings, remember, evolved in small gathering and hunting societies, you know, typically no more than 50 or 100 people. And now we live in a nation of the United States with 330 million people. Is that an appropriate scale for human, social, and political organization? Can we make a nation of 330 million people work, given the kind of animals we are? 
My answer is no, I don't think it, we can. So in addition to a smaller population consuming less, we have to think about smaller societies and how to move from nation states and you know megatropolises to more sustainable scale of living. Well, then we talk about scope. What is the scope of human competence to run all of this high energy, high technology? And that's a hard question because the obvious answer is we're not as competent as we think we are. And so to keep investing in high energy, high technology solutions creates a whole set of problems that, that will come down the line. And finally, the last hard question is speed. At what speed do we need to make major changes in the way we live if we are going to avoid the worst of collapse? And here again, it's a hard question because it appears we can't go fast enough. We don't know how to organize ourselves in a way to move that fast. The fact that you know we're talking about how marginal this conversation is in the first place tells us we're a long way from the speed of change needed. So those four hard questions, excuse me, size, scale, scope, and speed do not have easy answers. And it may be they don't have answers at all, at least not in the way we wish they did. But okay. they all seem to be, uh, I, 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 again, guys, I need to clarify, I have not read the book, yeah. but, I, but I'm, I'm going to fix that over the next few days. Uh, just based on what you said and, 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 and my reading of the tea leaves, every one of those that you just went through, it seems to me like we are going in exactly the wrong direction on every one of them. Sure. Well, there's obviously a backlash in um, some political sectors, especially the right, which, which is uh, a kind of hard, we could call it hard denialism, denying these are even problems. For instance, many people on the right think the problem isn't too many people, it's that we're not reproducing fast enough to replace- Elon Musk. Yeah. Right, okay. So there's, there's a kind of hard denial of some of these questions. And that comes mainly from the right, sometimes from especially the libertarian techno fanatic right. right? But there's a, a kind of soft denialism in the center and, and on the left, which I would say is not a denial of the problem, but a denial of the implication of the problems. Yeah. Right? So for instance, uh, a friend of mine, a very, very good uh, political activist and thinker, waved away the size question by just saying, oh, if everybody lived at the, the level of an average uh, third world society in energy consumption, we could support 8 billion people, no problem. End of story, right? Just wave it away. Uh, and so uh, I think there's hard denialism, soft denialism. And what denialism produces, of course, is delusions, a belief system that is not consistent with material realities. And we see that on the right, left, and center as well. For instance, there's some people on the left who love to argue that we can be 100% renewable energy by 2050 with no major disruption to the yeah. modern lifestyle. So that's just plain <laughs> wacky. Number one, because no combination of renewable, and I'm, I'm for renewable energy research development and, and implementation, don't get me wrong. Right? Solar, wind, it's all good. But the idea that any combination of renewable energy sources will replace the incredibly dense energy of coal, oil, and gas is a fantasy. Not to mention the fact that to make the technology to create renewable energy itself takes dense energy. You don't make solar panels with, you know, uh, uh, a fire. You, you need fossil fuels to mine to process all of it. So there's denialism everywhere that leads to these kind of delusions. Um, and I think that's an impediment. So again, the book is an attempt to say, let's stop denying, let's stop creating delusions, and let's deal with reality. And reality is often not pretty. I mean, we know that from our personal lives. You know, we've all, you know, been with people who died painful deaths, and denying that didn't help them, right? Pretending they weren't dying didn't help them. Right? We know in our own personal lives that we often have to face things that have no easy answer, maybe no answer at all, but we suffer together. Right? And I think, I, I never thought about it, that maybe that's the, the theme of the book. There is suffering ahead and 
and we need to start learning how to suffer together instead of you know pretending that that suffering can be avoided can it be avoided i don't think so personally i don't think any of the evidence in front of us suggests that we will act as a species in a time frame that makes it possible to avoid as we've been saying something that merits the term collapse now people point out there's already collapse going on in specific places around the world, which is true. But when we say collapse in this context, we mean a general global collapse in which there is a significant loss of population, uh, a loss of complexity in societies, uh, that kind of collapse. Uh, I don't wanna say inevitable because there are too many contingencies in history um, and, and prediction is not our strong suit as human beings, as I said. But I think we should be preparing for that likelihood, if not inevitability. Uh, and it means that we not only have to, to be willing to do things together, that's understood, right? There's gotta be collective action, but we have to learn to suffer together. Um, and I'd, I don't wanna sound glib about this uh, because human suffering um, is real. It's happening all around us in ways that really defies the imagination. For those of us who live in relatively stable societies with relatively easy access to food and shelter, it's hard to imagine, you know, the suffering that exists today as we're speaking. But when that suffering becomes global in nature, right, and, and shared even in the, the affluent societies, that's when we're going to really be tested. Uh, right now, we we aren't meeting the test, and the question is, can that change? Uh, and I have no better answer to that than anybody else. In, in a sense, it's not a question that we should pontificate about. It's a it's a question we should start acting on. Right? Start trying to figure out how to do it, uh, and do it in our everyday lives, and do it in our political lives as well. So how do we prepare for it? Obviously, yeah. this this is one yeah. of, one, of, one of the if not the yeah. hard questions, the big yeah. questions you mentioned. And we have to start learning how to prepare for it. Yeah. Well, how we we prepare, in the how book, are we preparing for it. In the book, we talk about the need for a focus on uh, skills, stories, and spaces. We need to tell new stories about what it means to be human because you know the stories we see today, you know, uh, are not going to to help very much the glorification of the wealthy, the obsession with spectacle entertainment. None of this is going to help us when things get hard. So we need new stories. We need new skills or in sometimes old skills, right? The skills necessary in a low energy society, which most of us don't have right, in the affluent world. And then we need spaces, new spaces. We're not gonna save ourselves online. I'm not saying there's no use for online technologies, obviously, but, in, in the not too distant future, we're going to have to deal with this face to face, which needs we need we need spaces to come together. Now, I mentioned that I live in in northern New Mexico now, in a largely rural area, and and one thing that's been really interesting is working with the acequia system. This is a an irrigation system uh, that is very common here in New Mexico. It goes back hundreds of years. Uh, the Spanish brought it over. The Spanish got it from the Moors and the Arabs. You know, it's 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 an old, reliable system of flood irrigation, but it requires cooperation. And so in the two years that I've been part of the local Asequia Association, I've seen what can happen in positive terms from that collaboration, where nobody owns the ditches, right? We're all members of an association that maintain the ditches together and share the water based on priorities and needs. Right? I've also seen how such collaborative enterprises can go bad very easily when you know one or two people decide they're going to mess up the system when greed takes over, right? You know, it's it's good to talk about small scale collaboration, but not because it's easy or it's you know romanticized. It's hard, just like all human endeavors. Uh, but those are the kind of things uh, that are important. We see more and more young people, certainly not a majority, but more and more young people in affluent societies like the US who have decided to forego traditional careers 
and try to learn to live more simply on the land. I have a bunch of former students from the University of Texas, smart kids who could have gone on to grad school, med school, who decided they didn't want to take that route and they've been working on farms or trying send to them, send them up to Bugs yeah. and Gar Farm. Yeah. Outside yeah. of Ithaca, New York, I, I got plenty, plenty of work. Right. So I would love to have some of them show up here. Right. So you can see the seeds of all of this. Uh, I don't want to be naive. It's not the majority of the culture. Right. But uh, when you start trying to do this pretty soon, you run into your own limits. Like, you know, I, I never knew how to farm or garden. I still don't know very well. Uh, I've been doing more manual labor in the last two years than I probably did in the previous 20 that I lived in the city. Right. And it's hard work. And you run into what you don't know. And you run into how complicated it is to be a good farmer without a lot of petrochemicals, right? So all of this you know, could seem overwhelming, but it's also kind of exciting. And uh, there are a lot of younger people who are, are seeing that route. Uh, is it enough people in enough time? Well, no, probably not. But these are the places you work at it. Uh, and there's one more thing, and, and this might be a, a good place to wrap up because it's, it's a kind of a positive note. Uh, are we allowed to? I, I can say something positive, can't I? Yeah, sure, I guess, sure. I, I can. guess we'll allow yeah. you to say something positive on this but, dreary near, show of mine. Near the end of the book, uh, we recount a conversation Wes and I had. Uh, Wes, as I said, grew up on a farm in Kansas, and he still lives in rural Kansas on a small piece of property. He's not a farmer anymore himself. But he called me one day and he, he said he was out for a walk on the prairie in, in Kansas where he lives. And he was just observing the world around him. Uh, he's, a, he's a real curious naturalist in that sense. You know, whenever he's out in nature, he's looking and asking questions. And he asked me a simple question. He said, why is this not enough? Why is being alive and open to the larger living world, to what we often call nature, why is that enough, not enough to keep us amused? He said, I'm looking around and it is amazing what I'm seeing, right? Uh, and he told me some of what he was observing. And he said, why do we need Las Vegas? Why do we need Disney World when everything around us is, is alive? Well, of course, you know, he lives in a beautiful place and, and not everybody does. Some people live in, in, let's say, urban areas that are nothing but concrete and asphalt and are, are hardly beautiful in that sense. But Wes is a big believer that you can find beauty everywhere, right? He, he, he riffs off an old Thoreau quote. He said, the world will always be more beautiful than useful, that beauty is everywhere if you look for it. And, and so in addition to all the hard things we're talking about, uh, Wes has also taught me that cultivating an appreciation for the beauty that is all around us is really important. And that we can all start working on, and many people do, uh, an increased appreciation, not just for all the glitzy, you know, uh, digital uh, extravaganzas around us. So instead of getting lost in the digital world, trying to immerse yourself in that larger living world. Okay, well, this is all part of the struggle. And, and the reason I say, I think that's ending on a positive note uh, is because that doesn't take a political program. That doesn't take a curriculum. All that takes is a, a decision to be in the world in a different way. And we can all do that, you know, without spending a dime. Uh, and I've learned that myself, uh, leaving a city and living in a more rural area um, realizing how much of my life that was hustle and bustle and on the go, you know, uh, really wasn't necessary. Uh, and, you know, I'm an old man, I'm 64. Uh, the, the real positive uh, is that more and more young people who are, are going to, you know, be here long after I'm gone are waking up to that long before. I'm a slow learner, Sam. It takes me forever to figure things out. So, uh, I do think there are younger people who are learning more quickly than I ever did. Yeah, I call it getting out there and enjoying it while you still can is uh, yeah. how I use the wrap up. Yeah. I, I wanted to, did, did you, 
must have been seven or eight years ago. Were you the fellow who wrote a an essay maybe in resilience.org? I don't know if I have you confused. That was titled something like Walking with Feet in Both Worlds. Does that ring a bell? No, but I not only don't remember everything I've read, I don't remember everything I've written, but no, I think. That, but just that, talking about on yeah. the, the essay, whether you wrote yeah. it to someone or yeah. one else and and uh, just want to start, start winding down here, it, it's just how you, how do you personally balance your life with the knowledge you have uh, the, 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 to be able to have the conversation yeah. that that we're having and and, and yet you, yeah. you know get up tomorrow and uh, whatever you're doing yeah. you know, go yeah. to the grocery store do your laundry uh d- just doing these normal things that you've been doing your your whole life how are you a- able to navigate you know what I'm saying? Yeah, Walking yeah. And feet in both worlds without it, getting too bogged down in either one of them. Yeah, it's it's a question that's often phrased as where do you find hope? And in fact, at the end of our book, Wes and I write separately about how we approach that. Uh, and uh, you know, when when people say, "How do you get out of bed in the morning?" I say, "I don't know," but the fact is, I do. What are my options, right? Um, I, I, I had a friend uh, who I, I wrote another book about. Uh, his name was Jim Coplin. The book is called Plain Radical. And Jim was my model for how to do this. Uh, he said to me once, he said, I wake up every morning in a state of profound grief because of what I know about the world. And yet he was uh, really a role model for me. He was uh, politically active. He was uh, volunteered in community groups. He raised an amazing urban garden. He was a great neighbor and friend to many people. Uh, He was a retired teacher who never stopped teaching young people, including me. I was young when I met him. And so I always keep my friend Jim Coplin in mind. He knew the worst that there was about the world. And he got up every day and he tended his garden and he tended to his human relationships with a certain amount of joy as well as that grief, right? And, and here, uh, the, the best thing I can say is to quote Wendell Berry uh, from The Unsettling of America, where he says, it's always been the fact that we live on what he called the human estate of grief and joy. We are not the first people that have had to try to balance grief and joy. In some sense, it is the human condition. Right? And as we deepen that sense of grief because of what we know, in a sort of strange way, it also, I think, expands our, at least I will say personally, it has expanded my capacity for joy. I am a more joyful person today, even though I know more about why that grief is inevitable. Now, I can't explain that. I just can tell you that's how my life has gone. Uh, I enjoy working. I like to get up in the morning and get things done. Uh, My life has meaning uh, to me. It doesn't mean everybody should live like me, but we all know how to find meaning in life. And if we do, then I think it makes it easier to face these hard questions and to do it with a certain amount of joy in our heart. Okay. And since this is the third time uh we we have spoken you might remember how i wrap up my uh my interviews uh probably not because it's been like four years since we spoke so robert jensen if you had 60 if you were not talking to sam mitchell at collapse chronicles where you could run on for 60 Mm -hmm. minutes but you actually had the mainstream and i don't mean the guardian i i I mean the real mainstream media sticking a microphone in your uh face uh advertising your new Mm -hmm. book and said robert jensen you have 60 seconds to get your message out uh to the planet and on the first day of september 2022 
in 60 seconds, what is what is your message to uh, to planet Earth? Yeah, this point forward. Well, I'm not going to try and be uh, that, that on target. I'm going to answer in a, a sort of roundabout way. Um, we are going to have to deal with less, less stuff, less energy. The world that I grew up in was a world always, we were promised endless expansion. We are now moving into a world of permanent contraction, right? And some people have, have decided that the way to try and sell that is to say less is more. You've heard this phrase, less is more. Yeah. Less energy, less consumption is more. That is, if you reduce your, your consumption, you'll be a happier person. Less is more. I don't like that formulation. Our book really is arguing that less is less, but less is okay. Right? We're going to have less of everything, less energy, less material, fewer material goods, but that's okay. Right? We are going to give up some things. There's a way in which it's nice to hop in a car and, and go see a friend you know, 100 miles away, but we're not going to be able to do that for much longer. So less is less, but less is okay. That is my bumper sticker to, <laughs> to describe the book. And it, if we can embrace less without illusions, right, uh, we can see that that is okay. In fact, that is the way most human beings live for the vast majority of human history. Uh, it's not a return to some nostalgic romanticized version of hunter-gatherers or early agriculturalists. It's looking forward to a world in which we can, we can really make good on Wes's question, why is this not enough? It is enough. That's what the book is about. That's my best shot tonight. We're going to make you Emmanuel Macron's speechwriter to try <laughs> to uh, reclaim his political career that he just <laughs> So I don't we, yeah, one more time. So tell us where we can uh, find your book and, and all that yeah. usual, usual stuff. Well, the book is An Inconvenient Apocalypse. The subtitle is Environmental Collapse, Climate Crisis, and the Fate of Humanity. Uh, kind That's of a mouthful. mouthful. All right. Uh, it did officially come out today, September 1st, but it's been available for a, a few weeks now in all of the normal places uh, online and in person. And if people want more information or want to read excerpts of the book that are available for free, uh, they can go to my website. The easiest way to find that is just to put my name, Robert Jensen, J-E-N-S-E-N, -E you have to spell it right. If you put my name in, in a search engine, my website will be the first one that pops up and you will find their uh, excerpts of the book as well as other information. And, and also information about other books Wes and I have done uh, before this one. So uh, easy to find online. Okay. And I want to add, I will be uh, posting links to our previous conversations from Great. a few years ago. So stick with us when we, when we hit stop record, okay. give Real me good. another couple of minutes. I know you're probably sick of talking to me, but, yeah. but hang on for just a minute because we're okay. going to let Jeremy come in here. And before we go, I just want to say, Robert Jensen, for the third time, I really, really appreciate you coming on here and spending an hour of your time with us. And uh, and I hope we can do this again. Sure. My pleasure. Thanks, Sam. And thanks, Jeremy, for handling the technical material. <laughs> no problem. Thanks. All right. So stick around, and uh, but we're going to hit the stop.